Good afternoon, everybody, and a, a very warm welcome to this Up Place Branding uh, seminar, part of the Up series. And uh, it's great to have so many people from not only from the UK, but from Europe and beyond joining us here today. Now, before we get into the heart of the programme, uh, let me firstly introduce Julian Stubbs from Up, who have uh, basically organising today's event. Here in Liverpool, we are delighted to host it. So for a bit more explanation about what the Plates Branding series is all about and a bit more about UP, over to yourself, Julian. Thanks a lot, Chris. Well, this is the second edition of what we're calling Plates Branding Question Time, which is a series of webinars dedicated to places and destinations. The first edition was back in November and came from my home city, the city of Stockholm. And today we're being hosted by the wonderful city of Liverpool Place, very close to my heart for many reasons. The idea of the series is simply this, to ask a select number of panelists representing some of the leading cities about some of the key topics facing place branding and destination marketing today. I think we all know the phrase, never waste a good crisis. Well, we have two critical topics today that could fall into that definition, COVID-19 and Brexit. And the question is, are they isolating Britain? Back to you in Liverpool, Chris, to start <coughs> answering the questions. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Julian. Yes, uh, I'm delighted uh, as, uh, as marketing Liverpool, director of marketing Liverpool, to be co-hosting this today with, uh, with friends at UP. And uh, we're going to have a good, a good hour's discussion around the implications and, and changes that are going on within place, particularly uh, around not only, uh, I think, Brexit and the implications of that, but particularly around the, the alliance of these two big issues of COVID and Brexit coming together. But before I get into detail, let's, let's meet today's panellists. We've got some, some great panellists on with us today from four superb port cities. So let me start by first introducing uh, Christina from uh, Barcelona Global. Uh, Christina, you know, you know, since 2019, she's been the project director at Barcelona Global, where she is in charge of the delivery of projects of the association. Amongst those is the launch of a new FDI attraction agency, Barcelona and Partners. And uh, we love Barcelona, uh, Christina, so we, we, we look forward to your, your contribution. And then if we move to the, to the wonderful city of Gothenburg uh, and to Andreas, uh, Andreas is the head of uh, foreign direct investments at uh, Business Region Gothenburg. In this role, he's responsible for attracting companies to establish a presence in the region and also for the Business Region Gothenburg talent attraction activities. Warm welcome to you, Andreas. We, we work with Gothenburg on the waterfront cities. Great city, uh, and so great to have you part of the panel today. And then if I go to our, our own homegrown talent here in Liverpool, uh, Colin Sinclair. Um, Colin is a, is a major player in the city of, of Liverpool and throughout the region, but he's the CEO of the Knowledge Quarter Liverpool, which is a vast urban innovation district home to some of the world's most influential players in science, health and technology. And he's also chief exec of Scientech Liverpool, which is the commercial spin-out of, of Knowledge Quarter Liverpool, operating Liverpool Science Park, managing Sensor City, and creating a world-leading innovation ecosystem. A busy man, indeed. And then finally, but uh, last but not least, uh, over to the, the wonderful city of Rotterdam, uh, and uh, delighted that Wilbert can join us today. Wilbert is the managing partner of Rotterdam Partners since 2019, and joined Rotterdam Partners in 2018 as International Trade and Investment Manager. And Rotterdam Partners is the official destination marketing organization and inward investment promotion agency of Rotterdam, so a, a, a warm welcome to you all. Um, so the format for today is um, very much a, an in conversation, um, very much interactive. So we'd like you, uh, people listening in, to join in. So please use the, the chat and Q&A function so that we can see what kind of things are, are interesting you. And I'll try and make sure we cover that within the, within the panel conversation. Or if not, the guys from UP will get back to you with the answers that, uh, that, you, that you've raised. Today's uh, event will be recorded, uh, so that will be sent out to you afterwards. And in order to get the, the sort of thing underway, I want to basically come to each of the cities just to get a little bit of a, a sense from each of you as to how the effects of, of COVID and the, the changing climate within Europe around Brexit, how are those things affecting 
the, your place at this moment in time. So just to get a bit of a snapshot of how life is in your various cities. So maybe if I start with yourself, Christina, in Barcelona, how's, how's life in Barcelona? How are these things affecting you? Well, we have a we have had a lockdown, quite a hard one. Uh, we have a curfew from ten in the evening until six in the morning, and some issues with the bars. But I think that's a general issue in in Europe. Um, and we've ob obviously have have had some impact in talent attraction. Uh, hopefully, that will be getting better when the situation gets better too. Okay, great. Thank you, Christina. And and um, Colin, from a Liverpool perspective, how how are you how is um, how are you seeing things in the city? Uh, well, we're we're all we're all facing this whole new economic paradigm, aren't we? You know, who who knew this was coming? Who was prepared for it? Uh, but you know, what I would say is that Liverpool, like all great cities, you know, use the port city analogy. We're all in choppy waters here. But I think our great cities are also great innovators. I think Liverpool's handled this really well. Uh, we've been the, the government pilot for mass testing. We're working with the government on new initiatives. And, and I think what's really important is Liverpool, like many cities, you know, has a really, really strong base in science and technology. You know, our cities are no longer industrial cities. We've become uh, a knowledge economy. And I think that's one really big way where Liverpool is actually managing to adapt to this new normal and then plan a recovery from it. So tough times, but I think there's optimism ahead. OK, and we'll, we'll come back to some of that stuff during the course of the event. And, and Wilbert, from a, uh, a Rotterdam perspective, how, how, how's things for you? Um, yeah, pretty much the same, I think, as uh, everybody in every city. But uh, I think as uh, Rotterdam being a city, uh, uh, one of the bigger port cities, and also the Netherlands as being one of the smaller countries, we really depend on everything uh, on an international perspective. We work internationally and basically everything we're doing as an international perspective. So when we were busy preparing Brexit, having COVID around the corner was definitely a perfect storm and made it pretty tough for everybody to uh, to prepare uh, all compliments to the to the to the port of Rotterdam who uh, had to do both these uh, let's say uh, both these disruptions in uh, in the same period of time and they did pretty well the port is still active they they run smoothly but uh, it's tough uh, for not only for the, all the businesses but also for for all the citizens of not only Rotterdam but also uh, citizens of the Netherlands so uh, we're hanging in there but uh, that's uh, maybe uh, with all the vaccina with the vaccination program now up and running. Hopefully, around the summer or after summer, we can uh, we can meet each other in Liverpool because that's one of the key things which I'm looking forward to. Great stuff. And and finally, uh, but not least, uh, Andreas in, in Gothenburg. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's um, two different uh, views on it actually. Uh, if we take a look at our uh, existing. Uh, industries and the business, the local business in Gothenburg is actually doing pretty well. Um, it, of course, apart from uh, hotels and experiences and restaurants, but uh, the industry is doing really well. And um, we have had another situation in Sweden where we haven't seen any lockdowns like many other countries, but we have, of course, we have a lot of regulations right now, but some parts of life has been possible to continue as usual. Uh, the biggest problem for us right now, I would say, is connectivity. Uh, which impacts both FDI and uh, talent attraction because it's really hard to get here right now. Uh, it's maybe, uh, I don't know, but maybe 10, 12 flights a day uh, to different destinations. Uh, and that, of course, is uh, causing uh, some issues and problems for us uh, right now. Okay, great. And, and um, whilst, we're, whilst we're on uh, Sweden at the moment, I'm going to take our first question. We're going to do two live questions today. And I will assure everybody listening that uh, the panelists have not been pump primed with the answers to these questions. So these will come, these will come live to them. So hopefully I've got, uh, I've got class there. Are you there, class? This is where the world of technology comes to play. Are you there, class? I think he needs to unmute, Chris. Oh, he needs there to unmute. Go. I think you need to unmute, mm. class. Got you. Can you hear us, class? 
Can, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, welcome to the webinar and delighted to, to welcome you to it. So, Klaas, please ask your, ask your question and then we will field it to the panellists. Yes, of course. Um, well, which place planning activity uh, did you recently execute that you are that you like the most? Okay, so that's this is a specific question about uh, any uh, interface or interaction or activity you've undertaken around place branding of, of late. Uh, could be about what you're planning to do also. Uh, so maybe if I come to you, Christina, in Barcelona to, to fuel that one first. Yes, let me first explain that I represent Barcelona Global, which is an association that is fully private and independent. And so um, our goal is not to specifically uh, city branding, but is making Barcelona a good place for talent and economic activity in uh, general. So our motto is make it happen. Rather than branding activities, what we do is actions to make Barcelona a better place. One of these activities, for example, is uh, doing a specific survey on the scale-up ecosystem. Barcelona is, a, um, is on the top uh, list of cities for startups, and we are um, researching what are the things that we can make even better for growing startups into scale-ups. That's my favorite one. Yeah, and I think you raise an interesting point there, uh, Christina, just in the context. I think that's how police branding has evolved in the future. It's not, not so much now about uh, strap lines and, uh, and, and campaigns. It's about the actions you undertake that bring your brand to life. So I think that's, a, that's an interesting context. And then maybe to, to yourself, Colin, here in Liverpool, in terms of you know certainly some of the work that you're doing up there in the in the knowledge quarter, and in a certain respect, it's changing the way that perhaps people will view Liverpool going forward. Yeah, we we talk about Liverpool as a city powered by knowledge, but fueled by culture. You know, so the knowledge economy driving the city, the city region forward, but the culture, the visitor economy, tourism has been such an important thing for Liverpool as a coastal city. Now, during lockdown, that part of the economy has almost gone into hibernation. We've all got to work very hard on its economic recovery. But um, as colleagues have just said, in different cities, it's kind of that can't happen at the moment. So it's given us an opportunity in place branding terms to really bring the knowledge core to the KQ, you can see on the wall behind you, to the fore. So, We've really focused an awful lot on where we can be world leading in health and life sciences. You know, not many people know, but you know, there's hundreds of millions of pounds worth of Bill and Melinda Gates money in Liverpool in the School of Tropical Medicine. We are a world leader in both infectious diseases and zoonosis. How has COVID-19 happened? Well, it's a disease which has jumped from animals to humans. A lot of that global expertise in Liverpool. So in terms of place branding, we've managed to bring that story to the fore. It's not only worked incredibly well with UK government and the positive approach of government to that part of Liverpool, but it's actually doing something to, do, to help with inward investment. And although people can't fly in now on a plane without quarantining to talk to us about their new clean lab space or office in Liverpool, they want to. And I think when the lockdown ends, that place branding work will really pay dividends. So, uh, so we haven't been idle, but we're, we're kind of getting ready for that next phase after lockdown. Great, and then uh, Andreas over in, in Gothenburg, uh, you know, how, how would you, what, what kind of activity have you been up to in this space that is uh, keeping the, the, the offer of Gothenburg alive in the minds of investors and visitors? Yeah, I would like to mention two different things. Uh, first, we're launching a, the International House of Gothenburg. Uh, it's being prepared right now, and we're going to launch it in the mid of April, uh, which will be the, the biggest of its kind uh, in Sweden, where we have just smaller versions of it before, where it's going to be really a one-stop shop for talents coming to the region, where they can get all the guidance and uh, all the help that they would, uh, would need. And that's, uh, that's something that we have foreseen for some years, and it's uh, really... Uh, it works really well for us in the place branding work. Uh, the other example is something that is actually not place branding, but it turns out to be that. And that uh, is the project Gothenburg Green City Zone, uh, which was launched by Volvo Car and the uh, city of Gothenburg together, uh, where we have get a lot of attention from all over the world about this project, 
where we have taken a kind of a rather big geographical area in the middle of the city where uh, the aim is to have 100% emission free transports uh, by 2030. Uh, mm. so it's going to be a lot of activity starting next year and this <clears throat> turns out to be very interesting for many different parties con uh, contacting us right now want, wanting to know more and how they can get involved and so on. Yeah, so, so it's, a, it's a local project that turns out to be place branding. Yeah, so exciting projects that you're doing there, not just for the short term, but really in, in, you know, embedding those in Gothenburg's strategy for the medium to long term in terms yeah. of dealing with some of these issues. Yeah, great. And, and Wilbert, from a, a Rotterdam perspective, I mean, Rotterdam uh, has changed as a city, hasn't it? It's changed dramatically. I mean, still got the port at its heart, but the city itself is a, is a very different city now. Yeah, it is. It is. And what we what we did in the last year, I guess, is first of all we wanted to keep the story of Rotterdam alive. So we created awareness across the globe with all kind of uh, webinars, virtual meetings, virtual fact finding, basically everything we we which was able to tell the story we did. And second, which second activity which I want to mention is the Rotterdam experiment. We basically, with all our partners around the world, we are discussing around uh, the, top, this, this, the, the topic of COVID and also the changing environment, what kind of disruptions will be the leading disruptions in the future. So we did that with AR, VR, AI, and all kinds of new experiments where we are figuring out what will be the new world, uh, uh, which is pretty exciting. So basically, we, we, last meeting, we did it around gamification and together with 200 people across the globe, we were figuring out how gamification can, can be supportive in the future, and the last thing, which is uh, which for us is pretty important for place branding, we have the Eurovision Song Contest in, uh, in Rotterdam in May, which uh, is pretty exciting because we will not have too many people in the city. So we're now working on a, a very uh, a new and innovative online concept, which we will reveal in a couple of weeks, to to at least make sure that everything related to Eurovision Song Contest is being connected to the Rotterdam brand. So. It's on different levels, but basically, uh, it's uh, you need to be uh, uh, you need to keep the story alive, and that's basically what we're focusing on. Yeah. Great. Well, I hope that new change in format might mean that Britain doesn't finish last as we normally do in the Eurovision Song Contest, but uh, we, 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 we shall will. see. <laughs> uh, but it's it's interesting. I think you know. Uh, I think what, as a as a marketeer myself, I think one of the challenges here is there's so much good practice and so many great ideas that emanate across not just these cities today, but many other cities and trying to keep a track and trying to find out best ways of collaborating and gathering that information to steer your own thinking, I think is, uh, is always a challenge. You always come up with, they always find there's different stories come out and today will be no different. So Klaas, did that, uh, did that answer your question for you? Yes, that was very interesting feedback. Thank you very much. Good, and thanks, thanks very much Thank for participating, Klaas, appreciate it. Okay, let's just move the conversation on a, a little bit in terms of um, the next question really around and I want to kind of explore now really about uh, the impacts of not only COVID, but also uh, Brexit on, on talent and the ability and what, what dynamics is you see in terms of around talent retention, uh, talent recruitment, and what impact do you think it's had on the, on the indigenous uh, workforce that you have in terms of maybe changes in work practices as we try to grapple with working from home and getting back into the office. So I kind of be interested just to get your views around this. So maybe back to yourself, Christina, from a Barcelona perspective, how, how, how are you seeing this in terms of talent? So for us, it has been a huge learning experience in general because most companies in Barcelona were not used to working remotely and most of them didn't even have the systems up and running, but it, uh, uh, they got up and running really fast. The telecom infrastructure worked really well. And uh, there are many companies that have been working remotely 100% since March. So that has been a positive le learning experience, as I, I say. Although I think that in the future, we should go back to a hybrid uh, scheme where there, are, there is some working remotely, but there is also some interaction which generates a lot of creativity that now it might be lost. In terms of talent, what we are seeing is that uh, many uh, companies that try to hire international talent have put those processes on hold, not because they don't need the talent, but because 
international talent is now reluctant to make an international move during the pandemic. So they are waiting for the situation to get better in order to start those, those processes again. And also we are seeing an increase in uh, processes to hire remotely directly. So for people to be working remotely uh, and either relocate once the situation gets better or just to stay in their countries working for a company that will be headquartered in Barcelona. Okay, and, and I, think, I think within that, uh, Christina, in terms of the, 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 the kind of implications of the, the changes in Europe with, you know, necessarily, this is a, clearly not a, a discussion around UK versus Europe, by the way, because I'll tell you, Liverpool will always be a European city uh, without a fear mm -hmm. of a doubt. But, but, but in terms of the, uh, the opportunities of uh, emerging around Asia and America and stuff, in terms of where you are thinking of positioning Barcelona, global city, where, where do they figure into your, into your kind of thinking in terms of expanding or, or developing into those continents? There are some natural links between Barcelona and Latin America for obvious reasons. Yeah. And there are some obvious links as well with Asia. And actually, there are many companies that have Asian links from Barcelona. So um, our proposal is that if you're looking for a location in the south of Europe, this is the right one. Yeah. Well, we'll, 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 we'll take that one. We'll take that. Um, <laughs> and and then maybe over to yourself, Wilbert, in, in Rotterdam. And, and also maybe just have a look about this in the context also of... Uh, you know, student and university populations, which I know even here in Liverpool is a is a massive uh, opportunity for us to create the the new employees of the future. How 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 are you finding the the whole world of talent? And what what do you think also about this kind of changing dynamics about you know how people will will look to use their time going forward uh, in in terms of learning from from COVID and the implications of that? Yeah, what we. Uh... The Dutch are a pretty uh, resilient uh, group of people. So basically, we, we managed to turn the whole system around pretty quickly. So basically, everybody is working from home. And uh, I think that's working pretty well. What we see, and I, I have to agree with Andreas, that it's not uh, COVID is not affecting all industries. Eh? Basically, there are a lot of industries who are still growing aggressively, and they need people. Yeah. So working on all kind of talent attraction programs, which they now are uh, working on it from a, it's now remotely organized, but um, when it's possible, these people will come to your city. So basically we are preparing everything. So we, we're putting everything in place to have these people here. So we need to be aware of the fact that the city should be attractive for young people, basically in the whole IT services, it's all about the international, young international people who want to come to the city. So we have to prepare everything, but up until now there are still people coming to the Netherlands and also coming to Rotterdam because these companies, which I'm just describing, they need the people. Students, uh, we have big two big universities, one medical and one uh, more business university. Yeah, they're suffering, uh, not with the amount of students, but that they have to work remotely. And you see that it's difficult. So um, the students are not that motivated. They are uh, uh, find it very difficult to, to have the same learning experience as they had before. But uh, having said that, uh, I think the, the city of Rotterdam is still very attractive for young people. These companies are still there. So I'm pretty confident that in the, the second half of the year that we are we're getting the same numbers of students and, and talents uh, getting in as we had before COVID. Okay. And uh, Andreas from Gothenburg, you touched on this a little bit uh, earlier in terms of what you're doing in terms of that attraction of talent. That you know, Just to build on that in terms of how you're finding that in, in Gothenburg at the moment. Yeah, I mean, we, as I said, we see a really big interest and maybe even an increased interest compared to last year's in terms of um, guidance and everything that we do uh, online right now. So when, when all the guidance moved online, we also reached out to more people, of course, uh, people that maybe are planning to come to Gothenburg instead of the people that are actually in Gothenburg right now. So we have, uh, I mean, each single... Um, spot that we have for guidance has been fully booked since uh, mid of October yeah. uh, 20. So we see a really, really big interest. Um, and I mean, in, in the companies, actually, I, th I would say there was kind of a smooth transition to start to work remote because the big companies are really, really used to it because they have people all over the world. It's been a bigger hurdle maybe for smaller companies. 
Um, in terms of people coming in, I would say that uh, during 2020, we maybe mm. somewhere ended up on 30 to 40 percent of normal levels of people actually coming here. So it's it's uh, much less than in a uh, regular year, of course. And it's due to many different reasons. It's uh, reluctance to actually move or uh, problems actually moving here. Um, but we also really believe that when things start to easen up and when its borders are opened again, uh, we will see a big, big increase because the need is still there uh, in, in, within the companies. Yeah, and then just we get the, that all the time. Yeah, and just picking up that point that um, Wilbert was saying, if you look at it from a, a Gothenburg, I think it is easy sometimes to. So I assume that everything, everything, uh, every business in life has suffered because of mm. COVID. But actually, th there has been some very successful businesses developed during COVID. A lot of innovation from existing businesses in terms of how they've changed direction. Uh, you know, if you're looking at across Gothenburg, how would you kind of uh, analyze that in terms of, of, of that sort of factor? Now, I mean, two major industries in Gothenburg are, are of course, uh, life science and uh, mobility or automotive industry. And uh, in terms of automotive industry, I mean, uh, we hear of record high in orders and they are uh, doing better than ever. Of course, they have had a, a downturn during 20 because when everything was closed and all the supply chains didn't work anymore. But not right now, it's really, really on high levels and also within a lot of the life science research, of course, uh, and some big, big projects for the future going on right now. So they, they also see bright to the future. So that's one example where we see right now maybe some more problems due to um, semiconductor crisis in the world uh, for the automotive industry. But um, up until now, it hasn't suffered Gothenburg so far, at least. Okay. And then, Colin, from a, from a, from a Liverpool perspective, um, you know, I talked there about the importance of our universities, uh, but also with the work that you're doing in the knowledge quarter, particularly in the health, the ability to attract, mm. retain uh, the, the the caliber of people that we need yeah. to to fulfil the ambitions. How, how do you how do you how do you look at it from a Liverpool perspective? Well, it was interesting what Andreas <coughs> said earlier about the one-stop shop for talent. You know, uh, great cities think alike. Mm. And that, that, you know, initiatives like that, and also um, I think it was Andreas as well who talked about taking cars out of the city yeah. centre and, you know, moving towards a better environment for our cities, net zero, carbon free. These are things which we have in common. And I think we're all getting better as cities in terms of that kind of innovation. But businesses are changing as well because of the pandemic. And... Flexible working is here to stay. You know, I, I'm in Liverpool Science Park where our offices are three or four days a week, and I love it. And if I spend more than two consecutive days at home on team and Zooms, I start to go slightly crazy. Because if you really want to, you know, work as teams, if you want to innovate, if you want to be creative, those incidental conversations across the desks and those side remarks in meetings, you know, that is so important to us. So. I think businesses are going to be more flexible, but what they're actually going to do is follow a theory called flight to quality. And we're really noticing in terms of the businesses already in Liverpool and the potential inward investors that now it's not about how big your office is or how cheap your office is or how many people you can pack into your offices. It's about a flight to quality. And people realize that if you're going to get people back into the workspace, you're going to have to allow them far more flexibility in their working, but the workspace has got to be so much better. Yeah. And we're seeing that in every inquiry that we handle. Quite often, people aren't downsizing as they move to flexible working. They're actually spreading their people out yeah. in the office. <laughs> They're giving better okay. space, better air handling, windows that open. You know, these, it's almost going back in time, isn't it? But we're, we're planning a £30 million building called Hemisphere, named after the two sides of the human brain, logical and creative, at our Paddington Village development, and we're going to have opening windows. My God, that's revolutionary. But, you know, that is the future. <laughs> Great stuff. Right, we're going to go to uh, another question now. So I'm using my Scottish uh, uh, influence here as the moderator to go back to my home city of Glasgow, hopefully, and to, to welcome Gavin Smythe to the, to the conversation. Uh, are you there, Gavin? I am, yes. Good uh, afternoon, everyone. Brilliant. So what's your question to the panel, Gavin? So 
My question is, with the established FDI model significantly under threat from the pandemic, what alternatives need to be considered? And also, what macro trends do the panel believe will have the biggest impact on inward investment strategies? Okay, I'm going to ask that question, Gavin, and then I'm going to come back to you to get a Glasgow perspective on that. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so let's, uh, let's, well, let's start with yourself, Colin, on that mm -hmm. one, yeah? Uh, it's, a big, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big question. Yeah. Uh, maybe not an easy, you know, not a simple answer mm -hmm. to it, but in the context of that point, what, what's your take on it? Well, you know, that, that flight to quality is a big <coughs> part of it. So, you know, people aren't going to scrap the office, but the office has got to be a whole lot better. You know, I, I was talking to people the other day and calling it back to the future, not the movie, but back to the future in that you're going to come back to the office, but it's got to be the, it's got to be the future office. So there is going to be a change, I think, in how people um, design and take up their workspace. But there's a bigger trend in the UK now, this might not apply to all the international colleagues. You know, Liverpool isn't, isn't a capital city. It's not the second city in size in the UK, but it's a very big regional city and a global brand. And what's going to be important to us, I think, as a result of the pandemic, is something called North Shoring. And I think that will apply to Glasgow as well. And I think as businesses look again at their footprint, Pick up on Andres's point about the absolute importance of talent. Great building design is important, but you've got to be able to recruit people first and foremost and retain them. If you look at that, I think there will be a move away in the UK from London and the Southeast, and there will be a migration to quality space in the likes of Leeds, Liverpool, Manchester, Glasgow, and those northern cities where you've got the talent, you'll have the innovation in workspace, but you'll be able to do it in a much more affordable and sustainable way. So I think that's, we will see a north shoring trend in the UK. Um, hopefully that will be backed up by foreign direct investment, but I think <coughs> the north shoring trend, whether they're UK owned or foreign owned companies, will come from London and the southeast and move like a wave to the north. Yeah, and just, just picking on that point around FDI in terms of the context of the changing relationship with Europe. Hmm. I mean, how do you think that, how do you think, you know, because clearly, you know, this is also about, you know, there would be benefits to European uh, countries from this, benefits to UK. How, how do you yeah. see that dynamic playing out? It's really interesting because the, there's <coughs> probably no more European city in England than Liverpool. And I think if you look at the referendum, you know, Liverpool was strongly behind staying in the European Union. So... I think Liverpool's relationship with, with the EU won't change. You know, there's regulatory change, but people and business perspectives won't change. I think what is interesting for Liverpool, and, and it will be for Glasgow as well, I think, is things like the government free port status and the fact that if Liverpool faces the Atlantic and Liverpool looks at North America, Liverpool Football Club is owned by people in Boston, there are huge historic shipping and trading links between Liverpool and America. So I think what we're all hoping going forward is we can retain our friendships and our trade with Europe, but we can actually become stronger in our transatlantic trade as well. Great, OK. And then, Wilbert, from a, from a Rotterdam perspective? I think one of the key global <coughs> trends uh, started already with the US-China trade war and then with Brexit and also with uh, the pandemic, it's that every foreign business and also local businesses, they're re-evaluating their supply chains. They're basically figuring out how and um, how are, they, 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 they need to be, they, they need to have more reliable uh, supply chains because of these these disruptions. It's, um, it made them more weak, it made them vulnerable. What you see right now is that uh, because of Brexit, European, uh, foreign direct investments are looking at the, uh, the European continent and, and, and Rotterdam specifically because of the fact that they, they feel that uh, they need to be in the European Union. The same with Chinese companies who are, don't rely anymore on these big, uh, on their isolated supply, supply chains, only delivering from China to Europe, but they also are looking at factories around the globe. Basically, what you're seeing is that everybody wants to be uh, is, is aware of the fact that the let's say the the 
the paradigm we had before uh, uh, Brexit, which has something to do with global supply chains, it becomes more local supply chains. And we are, that's <coughs> what we're seeing in the Netherlands. That's an opportunity, an opportunity from a, a country perspective and also an opportunity from a European perspective. And that's one of the key elements we see with Brexit as well. Uh, the, uh, the UK has become uh, unpredictable. It's basically, it's for a lot of investors, the uncertainty which is there. Uh, uh, they don't like uncertainty. They want to have a stable environment, stable government. They basically want to be have a predictable counterpart. And what we see right now is that with this local supply chains building up, and uh, with the with the fact that they are looking at more reliable uh, supply chains as well, it's uh, it's it's giving us an opportunity for new FDI and maybe. Um, that will uh, there's something to discuss in the future as well uh, with other countries. Yeah. Interesting, interesting. And <clears throat> Christina, from a from a Barcelona, Barcelona Global, uh, in terms of the, the changing world of FDI and uh, you know that the, 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 the points that Colin and uh, uh, Boba were just making, what's your take? Mm -hmm. Our approach, well, uh, Chris, as you mentioned, we are sponsoring the launch of uh, an agency for FDI attraction and our, our uh, strategy for that is to target specifically the companies that we want to come. Uh, so Barcelona is well positioned for uh, some uh, activities, so it's a natural place for digital hubs and we have many digital hubs from international companies like Nestle or Zurich or Bayer or SAP, etc. Uh, but we want to uh, grow some specific clusters that are well position, positioned in the city, and those are Internet of Things, genomics, and uh, sustainable mobility. So we are identifying, um, we are launching a very, very sophisticated market intelligence model to identify exactly the, the companies that we want to attract and target them. I think that's, uh, that might be a trend in FDI, uh, keeping your positioning, and you have to work for that, but also making some very specific target, um, targeted uh, So you're taking, you, you're taking, therefore, in that regard, a very much more of a rifle shot to this in terms of not just going uh, for any investment you can possibly have, but being very specific about the types of clusters that you want to attract. And then I presume making sure that you've got the infrastructure and the talent and things around that to encourage that FDI to come into that, into, into Barcelona. That's a... That, that clearly yes. looks a very so deliberate will, strategy. We, sorry. Yes, we will, we will still be open for <clears throat> all sorts of investment that want to land, and that will still be uh, taken care of. But we are taking a very proactive approach for some uh, specific subsectors and some companies within those sectors. Okay. Uh, and Andreas in, in, in Gothenburg? Yeah, uh, in, in terms of the FDI strategy, of course, um, I mean, our main source of new contacts has been moving around in the markets, in meeting places and trade shows and wherever. Um, of course, that's not possible right now. And so we, we started right now with a project uh, where we are, we try to be more digital or in the whole process, of course. Um, so we, we are launching different movies and campaigns on uh, selected markets. And then we follow that up on these markets with uh, with uh, online seminars like this uh, regarding different topics that might be of interest and in that way try to find new interesting contacts and uh, eventually could lead us to new leads of course and then at the end sometimes in the future uh, wrap everything up with a physical meeting or actually traveling to that market uh, so we right now we do that currently on three different markets in the same time so we we are in three different stages in the three different markets we try that out uh, but overall i have to agree with christina we we try to be more selective of course as well uh towards the key industries so the key sectors for our region um in in terms of the macro trends i, I mean it's of course digitalization has been mentioned uh, many times before it's huge uh, and uh, automation of course as well um but otherwise i think also uh, <coughs> climate change and everything connected to to the green industries is um uh, it's something, it's really strong and it's something uh, that is strong in our minds. And we have to realize that we, we've been working with a lot of these issues for a long time, but we maybe haven't been really good enough to talk about it because it's, uh, we took it for granted. So we, yeah. we start to talk more about that also in our FDI projects. Um, 
and then of course uh, I think everything connected to to our new habits and uh, it's not only due to COVID but partly but of course uh, the increase of the logistics system the supply chains and uh, e-commerce uh, these are some big things really affecting how we work in the future okay so back to yourself Gavin and in, in Glasgow there did that um I mean, hopefully that, that kind of, you, you got some insights into your question there in terms of the answers that were given there. Um, so what, what, what's, the, what's the kind of feeling in Glasgow around that, or the, the, the question that you asked? I think, yeah, I mean, I, I, the, the answers echo a lot, the, the same, uh, same things that we're looking at, to be honest, you know, um, we're aware that FDI flows are projected to drop significantly, they already have, and probably not due to recover to 2022 at least. So, you know, we're doing a lot of the similar similar strategies. We are digitizing a lot of our promotional activities and how to map the city, uh, its, its asset base and its infrastructure, and also what it has to offer uh, in terms of its um, specific strengths, etc. Um, and to to be able to promote that internationally and offer that visibility. So we're, we're certainly um, focusing a lot on that. But I think also things like mapping the uh, the tech and the innovation ecosystem in the city as well so that we are able to connect our larger corporates to the kind of thriving scene over here, uh, that business base, uh, and the areas of specialism that, that are well, particularly um, of important to investment. So there's a lot of areas that we're concentrating on um, from, from that perspective. But um, yeah, I, th I think it's going to be interesting going forward. I think everyone traditionally has used uh, the model of FDI and you know the jobs that that would bring in the capital investment that would bring into the city, but going forward, if we have to be re rest reliant on that, then maybe we have to look at like you know non equity type metrics uh, in terms of you know being able to connect companies through partnerships and joint ventures, <coughs> etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So I can see that becoming more prominent. Yeah. And I think just finally, my point would be certainly I would agree that in terms of macro <coughs> trends, in terms of climate change, sustainability, that is a huge one for us especially with COP26 coming mm. up in Glasgow later in the year. So obviously that's a huge window of opportunity for the city and the city region to showcase what's happening on the ground over here and to show that we are extremely keen, as the Scottish Government are, on focusing on green investment opportunities. Great. Well, Gavin, great to, great to have you on the webinar today. Thanks for asking the question. Uh, great question. And uh, <clears throat> I hopefully I'll be able to return to Glasgow sooner rather than mm -hmm. later, I hope. Thanks, good. good to see you. Good to see you. Okay, so I'm just going to come on to the, the final round of questions now. I'm going to go to Wilbert first because uh, I know Wilbert has to, has to leave us for another pressing engagement in Rotterdam. But I just want to touch on this area around, uh, you know, how, you, how, how you're going to, going forward, tell your story. So people are around often about the branding and place branding is, is often about how you tell your story. And I'm just interested to know in, in the context of the, the balance between where we used to do that, where we went to large physical events like Expo Real or MIPIN or other events to do that. And, and, and now what we've learned through the, the ability to get to digital audiences through Zoom and everything, how, how is this going to, well, how are you reflecting on this in terms of how to tell the story? So in your case, Wilbur, how are you looking at it now about telling the story of all the great things happening in Rotterdam? Um. Yeah, first of all, I think uh, I have to agree with Christina and Andreas that it needs to be more targeted. Eh? When, when we, in a, I think a couple of years ago, we were flying around the world telling a very generic story, but if you want to be a significant player, you need to be very distinctive. So we also were pinpointing on the key elements of the city of Rotterdam. Of course, we're in innovative port, maritime services, from the fact that you're a big port, the energy transition is one of the key challenges in the future. But I think the story we're going to tell, more targeted, is has something to do with all the innovative solutions to this energy transition, because it's not something which is, which will be covered by the, the petrochemical industry itself. It will really be covered by all of these start and scale ups who are coming up with all kinds of innovative solutions. And the crossover between the two that's uh, the, the sweet spot we are looking at, and that's the story we want to tell, more targeted. And uh, I think the opportunity, I think the one of the, the uh, what the COVID-19 uh, period learned us is that we're also able, like we're doing right now, uh, you don't need to be in the country every single week to tell your story. You can do it uh, differently. 
but uh, the, the quality, the, 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 the story really, your targeted story, you need to tell it more personally. So you need to increase the quality of your meetings and maybe go to the country itself to do that. But if you want to keep your brand alive and tell your, let's say your more generic story, you can do that with virtual meetings. You can do that with webinars. So I feel, and I think Christina also mentioned it, it will be a hybrid model, not a hybrid model itself, but the, let's say all the commodity information, we will do that via social media, via our internet, via all kind of more <coughs> virtual activities, yeah, yeah. the more targeted qualitative uh, activities and, and, and building on the relationship we have right now, we're still going to do that physically. So we need to go to, to, to Asia again to meet with our counterparts. We need to go to the US again to meet with our uh, relationships so, uh, relations over there. Do that with a targeted story. Like I said, the crossover between the more traditional industries in the in the Rotterdam region and innovative solutions, which we are working on right now to 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 work on that energy transition. Because I agree with Christina and Andreas, that's the biggest challenge we have in the near future. Yeah, so you're talking about there is a lot more about <clears throat> you know if you are going to do international travel, you are going to go out from Rotterdam. You're going to be you're going to look a lot. I think all of us now will look a lot more carefully about what's the most effective way to get to that audience and necessarily yeah. not, not uh, you know, we'll, we'll make us think a bit more, I think, about before we just jump on a plane or whatever, we'll think a bit more about what we're, what we're trying to achieve at the other end and whether we could do it differently. Yeah, we, maybe one example in uh, the, the World Expo has been postponed for a year. Uh, we, we are there with a, a Dutch pavilion, but Rotterdam has a very distinctive relationship with the, uh, with the Middle East and with the... Uh, UAE, but we're really pinpointing it around the, the, the topic of water, food and energy, which basically for us is a, a, a targeted approach. We're looking for that type of relationships. And the, um, uh, we're really figuring out and we're really targeting on the relationships we want to build on uh, uh, from that topic. So that's a targeted approach and we're doing that also in a couple of regions. So we're not flying around the globe anymore like we did before. We're really looking at the, 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 the cities where we want to build a relationship with on a certain type of topics. And then uh, we definitely will do that physically. But again, I think the, 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 during the COVID period, we, we learned that you can do a lot of things remotely, but building a relationship shall all be face to face. Well, I hope, uh, Wilbur, at some stage we can do that physically with you when we can discuss waterfront, no football, wa waterfront football stadiums, hopefully, at some stage of life. Yeah, that would be a nice, yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be a nice conversation yes, with bye -bye. you. Okay, good to see you, Wilbur. Thank you very much. Um, so, if I go to yourself, Colin, just from a, you know, looking at, you know, you, 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 you know, you've worked with us and we've worked with you, you know, we've, you know, in terms of how to tell the story of Liverpool yeah. and what, what are, you know, in terms of how you look at it now in terms of, you know, how you're going to kind of position the work that you're doing and, and the, the, the balance there about how you're going to achieve that. What's your kind of thought, what, what, what is this pandemic, what food for thought has it given you about how to tell the, the great story you're developing up there at the Knowledge Quarter? Yeah, you know, um, you talked about storytelling, you know, the importance of a compelling narrative. Yeah, that, that, that's where we're at. And in this, in this in this place we're at now, we can't all go to MIPIN, we can't all go to the, you know, to the big conferences and conventions. We've got to tell our story in a really succinct way. And I think all the colleagues on the call are absolutely right. You've got to really be clear about what your points of difference are, what you specialize in. Mm -hmm. Now I mentioned Liverpool, Knowledge Quarter Liverpool, and research into infectious diseases. You know, the, it's called the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine but most of the trials were in Liverpool, not in Oxford. Yeah. So, you know, that specialism in infection and disease is important, uh, as is our big pharma production. The flu vaccines, the COVID vaccines are made at speak in Liverpool. So to be clear about what you specialise in will help to get messages across. But I also think we need to really work in partnership. And if you look at the scale of health innovation in Liverpool, Manchester and Cheshire, that's the global scale if you're talking to Chinese investors, sovereign wealth funds, or America. So I don't think we should see any of our cities in isolation. I think that's why events like <coughs> this are so important. We can collaborate as port cities, we can collaborate as neighboring cities, and we can collaborate with other global cities that have common strengths. And I think that strength of partnership is going to be really important going forward. You know, this is about doing things for the greater good 
and not just for self-interest. So um, I think this event is great, and this is the kind of thing that, that will you know, definitely make up for not being able to meet in person for the time being. Yeah, great. And then and Andreas, <coughs> yeah, from, a, from a Gothenburg perspective, how do you, what, what's your sort of take on this in terms of, you know, you, you clearly, throughout, you know, the, 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 the last 50 minutes we've had together, you know, painted a very compelling story about what you're, what you're doing in Gothenburg, what you're, what you're seeking to do. So in terms of how you see the telling of that story in this, in this new world of digital and physical, um, how, how, what's your kind of thinking about the best way to do it? Yeah, I, I really think, like Christina said, uh, the future will be hybrid somehow. Uh, I, I think in some senses we for sure want to come back to actually the, to meet people in, uh, live again. And that, will, uh, that would also be, will be important in some uh, cases or some parts of the process. Uh, but I also believe a lot of things that we learn now, uh, we're going to keep them and continue to do them as well. Um, in terms of doing online activities, we, uh, I mean, one year ago, it was pretty okay to do something from a, from a computer cam and uh, maybe not the most professional way. Uh, but we pretty quick understood that we need to do, we need to have a fit to purpose for, for the quality of what we're actually doing. So. If we're doing really, really big seminars with, we've done it twice now with the Philadelphia and Gothenburg relations. Mm. Um, we we <clears> more <throat> do it like a TV production. Uh, so it's it's get because it's it's not a seminar that we had to do online because people can't come. It, it was totally planned for online activities, and then we can do it more like a TV production. Um, but I think uh, in the future we'll be both hybrid. So we will have physical meetings with people and online at the same time. Uh, but also uh, both ways. Sometimes it's actually going to be physical, and sometimes it's only online. Uh, and it's gonna, it needs to fit its purpose. Uh, um, so uh, I think Colin said it really well uh, that we back to the future, also in this sense, as it's going to come back to normal, but it won't be the old normal. It's going to be something new. Okay. And and Christina in Barcelona, I mean, you've 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 touched on this uh, a few times during the, the the course of this webinar in terms of your. The, the kind of well thought out approach you're, you're adopting in Barcelona. I'm also interested in there, you know, how you use the, the businesses of Barcelona to tell that story from you, as, for you, as well as what you, what you will do as, 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 as Barcelona Global in terms of your outward facing work. So how, how, how are you seeing this changing or giving your considerations to how you're going to tell that story of Barcelona? Well, as I mentioned, Barcelona is a hub for digital hubs. <laughs> uh, so many international companies have a digital hub in Barcelona, and that by itself, it by itself tells the story of the city in the headquarters of those companies. So that's a privilege that that we fortunately have. Um, then um, in Barcelona Global, we have as members most of the companies of the Barcelona region, most of the um, uh, research centers and universities. So that's a, a good network as well. Uh, and uh, our goal, as I mentioned, is to make things happen. So what we do is to uh, bring down all the activities into projects and try to deliver those projects so that the companies that are already here have a better environment to work and the companies that want, come, that want to come find a better place to come as well. And those areas are, uh, fr go from talents, so from simplifying the administration work for uh, international professionals that have to relocate here, to, as I mentioned, trying to make it an even better place for startups to scale up. To scale up. Uh, and uh, I don't, I'm not sure if I answered your question. No, 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 no. I, I don't. I, I, it's not a kind of black and white question in that respect. I think it's. Okay. I know that it's, it's. It's what we are also thinking about in terms of, you know, the, how we. You know, I think this definitely will change the way that we tell our story about Liverpool. Uh, I think there's no doubt about that. And I think we were probably on a bit of a hamster wheel of doing, you know, physical event. We went there every year. We did that every year. So we go back and do it. And I think this has given us a chance to analyze that and just maybe recalibrate and say, well, why did we do that? And mm. should we continue to do that? Is there a better way of doing it? Yeah. And I think that's the, that's the new, uh, that's the new sort of the new normal in a way, I think. 
Yes, as I said, for us, the strategy is very targeted. Uh, we will be doing events in uh, some targeted cities, uh, and we've done it before. Uh, but our strategy is not to is not to send a global message. It's to target the companies that we want to attract, and then yeah. obviously, if there are other companies that want to come, they are very welcome, and they will be well taken care of. Okay, great. Now I'm just I'm pretty sure we're coming towards the end of today's session, so I'm just going to kind of finish with one question. I'm going to I'm going to just go back a little bit and pick up the point that Colin mentioned earlier around north shoring, um, and and I mean that more in the context of how you maybe see. Uh, you know that I know certainly in the UK, uh, the capital city was always the place, uh, and we were always sometimes here trying to you know struggle against the capital as to why you would invest outside the capital, and the rationales around the quality of life. It picks up a question that uh, Peter from uh, who's attending raised about, you know, has raised in the in the chat about the the opportunities of people working in an environment where they feel more comfortable, open spaces, not being in a crowded city center. So I'm just interested, I might just stay with you on this one, um, Christina, how do, you, how do you see potentially in Spain in the context between you know, the, 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 the capital city as it was, and now the growth and potential of regional cities uh, moving forward in terms of being able to attract and position themselves differently now where capital cities maybe not quite the same huge focus that they uh, they have been in the past. Uh, in Spain, we have a regional structure. So uh, there are several cities that are very strong in attracting uh, international uh, foreign direct, sorry, foreign direct investment. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, Madrid is a very strong city attracting investment. Barcelona traditionally is very, very strong attracting investments. Uh, in 2018, it was the seventh in the world, but there are other cities as well. Valencia is a strong attracting FDI as mm -hmm. well. That's because of the regional um, structure, I imagine. Yeah, okay. And, and Colin, just, you know, maybe just reflecting and building on what you, uh, you I think you were starting a conversation there about, which I think, I think it would be fair to say that in the context of what <laughs> Christina was talking about, uh, the UK is very different. It, yeah. it, it, it is, whereas I think in, as, as Christina was saying, in Spain, the, those regional cities have got an identity. They've got a very clear focus and they, and they do attract a lot. In the UK, London has always been, we've been very centric in, in, in the UK. So do you see that this, this is a, a, a kind of watershed moment in a way in terms of regional cities like Liverpool and Manchester yeah. and others? I think the pandemic has taught us a lot about resilience. Mm. And if you're, if you're a, a national government, why would you put everything <laughs> of importance in your capital city? Why would we concentrate all our science and R&D in Oxford and Cambridge and what's called the Golden Triangle? It, it, it doesn't help any economy. It doesn't help us to solve all our environmental issues and focus on climate change if we continually invest in our capital cities across our regional centers. If we want to build a fair economy, uh, what's called inclusive growth, if we want sustainable inclusive growth, if we want um, a better environment, if we want a more sustainable economy in the face of what will be future pandemics, you know, most scientists predict another within five years, then we should decentralize our countries. And I think the, the offer that you can find outside London and Cambridge, across the UK, is something that I think businesses and government alike are going to very seriously look at. Yeah. I think it will change the balance of an over-dependence in the UK on London as the capital. Yeah. And I think that's <clears> going to be really important going forward. Um, we don't all have to travel to the capital city to do business. Yeah, good point, good point. And, and I'm going to give you, Andreas, the final, the final words from today in terms of, you know, you mentioned earlier for Gothenburg about the importance of connectivity. Um, so in that context for you, you know, in terms of, of, of the capital city of, of, of you know, in, in, in from a Stockholm perspective, how, how, do you, how do you see this developing? Do you see it as an opportunity? No. Yeah, uh, definitely. But I think, I mean, Stockholm is really great in attracting capital, uh, of course, uh, number one in Sweden for sure. But we see a lot of investments coming to many different parts of Sweden. Mm. Uh, and especially in the investments <coughs> that we've seen in recent years where they need maybe a lot of power or, a lot of, or huge land areas, it's not really possible in Stockholm or in Gothenburg. So then we see other parts of Sweden really 
get a lot of uh, business uh, through these investments. I would say in, in Sweden, actually, maybe the biggest problem is that the government puts basically the vast majority of all authorities are located in Stockholm. Uh, it's very centric to Stockholm mm. in terms of uh, authorities. Uh, and uh, not so many, maybe 50% of them are located in Stockholm. That's a bigger yeah. problem than yeah. it's that we can actually attract FDI products to the whole country. Yeah, great. Yes, and I'm trying to, I try to throughout the last hour make mm. sure that we weren't dogged by politics. Yeah, which was <laughs> determined to have a conversation with words. But uh, we're now coming to the end of, of of today's webinar. I think you know I've certainly, as the moderator, found it really quite fascinating in terms of the different stories. We maybe haven't solved all the problems of the world in the last hour, but I think we've uh, we've taken a good march to to take on some of the subjects that will affect us all. And I hope you as the audience have really enjoyed it. This was, as I say, we'll be out on our recording. So it just goes to say for me, I'd just like to, a couple of thanks, uh, certainly to Julian and, uh, and definitely to Ardy uh, up for all the help in coordinating today's event. For you know our colleagues and friends here in Liverpool, MSP Studio, uh, for, for doing the arrangements for today and for you guys for, for, for joining the audience today. Um, I'm sure, um, hopefully, that uh, today will in, in infuse you to join another Up Place Branding question time in the future. But from us here in Liverpool to our friends and colleagues in Rotterdam, Barcelona uh, and Gothenburg and here, greetings from Liverpool. We hope to see you physically one day. And, and, uh, but we would like to thank you for all your contributions today. Hope you've enjoyed the, the session. Hope you enjoyed the discussion. Look forward to seeing you again soon. In the meantime, keep safe and well. From Liverpool, bye-bye.